There's a big truck. I'm gonna put this thing over here, I guess. Um, I think I should be live. Let me just check. Okay. I'm going to wait till noon here and then I'm going to get started. Hi, John. Hi, Sasa. Seeing some comments over here. Good afternoon. Verbal SS, I guess is how you say that. I have partly Sunny and Lori. Hi, Jake. Hi, Susan. Hi, Philip and Edward. What is Truth Ministries? Hi, Jack Hammer. Since I'm Christian going to court and swearing on a Bible, um, I don't think you should swear to oaths. So I would say don't swear on a Bible. Um, hi, John. And hi, Michael. Um, hi, Steve. Ministry of Truth. Roy. Hi, Tim, Rachel, uh, yeah, just to, I'll just kind of say here the, hi, Susan and hi, Rose, um, I'll just say this right here, the book right there, I'll be talking about it here when we hit noon, I'm going to wait a couple minutes just to let everybody get in here, um, what's a good book on the Godhead, <laughs> the Bible, uh, no, all, in all seriousness, I don't really know if there are any right now. I know Brother Jacob Thompson is working on one, but um, so okay. Hi, Stephen. Okay. Praise the Lord. Uh, what is Truth Ministries? I appreciate that. Um, so, like I said, um, found three biographies so far for Sheffy. Huh. Not familiar with the other two. This is uh, one by Jess Carr. I think this is the, the one that they supposedly based the movie on which is what we're going to be talking about here um so mm. hi brother jacob Got three minutes yet, and we'll get started. Have I announced my secular channel yet? Yes, I have. It's called uh, Northern Maine Off Grid. So. 
Did I get your letter from Estonia? Uh, I'll have to ask my wife about that. We get, she, she, when we get letters at the post office, she'll take them and she'll, you know, write addresses or names or whatever else. And then we get, do we hear, hear from this person yet? Um, and then she'll take, kind of take care of it and whatever. So I'll have to ask her. Uh, Yeah. Hi, John. Gale Force Ministry there. Um, kind of holding off on the uh, the second channel. Um, I'm going to be releasing a lot of stuff on uh, almost like a seminar on off grid and everything I've learned over the years. Um, I've learned quite a bit. I've been in a lot of different off grid situations, both in America and Central America. So. Um, and I've been in Alaska, and I've been in Montana and Pennsylvania, northern Pennsylvania and things, seen a lot of off-grid ideas and off-grid things and whatever. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that stuff on the off-grid channel. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work putting everything together, but looking forward to getting it done. But I've just been working on getting some other projects uh, up and going. So we'll see how that goes. We're at 11.59. We'll be starting here soon. So Okay. Yeah, I haven't. I don't know if I've heard of those other ones. Um, the other books on Sheffy I'm talking about. Uh, what's the website address for the audio downloads of your videos? Oh, brother. Um, I'm not sure on that. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to look on and, and see if I can. Was it Media Fire? I think something like that. Somebody else made it for me. I don't, I don't know. All right, it's noon. Might as well get started. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And um, this is something that has been on my mind for a very, very long time, many years, um, a long time ago. I was going to a church, Baptist church called Mount Zion Baptist Church. Pastor's name was, was uh, Keith Schweitzer. He it was in uh, Denver, Pennsylvania. He had gone to um, Bob Jones University. Bob Jones University uh, was the one that came out with the Sheffy movie. I don't have my copy of it here right now, but um, the Sheffy movie, it was, uh, I think it's, was it Strange Films or something like that? I, I can't think of the name of the um film company from Bob Jones University, but they were the ones that came out with it. And he, you know, I, I got to talking about it or whatever else with him. And uh, I asked him if he'd ever read the book, you know, the, the Saint of the Wilderness, because this is what the, the movie was based on right here, this book. And he said, yeah, he said, actually, I have a copy of it. And at the time, it was so hard to find copies of this book. And I think I saw one and it was over a hundred dollars or something crazy um, on eBay. And um, I always wanted a copy of this book. And uh, I looked at his copy and, and and he made a couple little comments and remarks about it and whatever, but he didn't get into too much detail. Um, hi, everybody else is joining in. And so I, I just, it's always been gnawing away at me, you know, this movie. You know, I because you know anybody that makes movies, apparently, you know, anybody I've ever had experience with, they always stretch the truth and change things and whatever else. Hollywood, especially, you know, they always, oh, we're going to tell the true story of such and such, and then it's you read the actual book and it's not even close to the real thing. But I figured Bob Jones University, being a you know Christian university, would be closer to the actual events of Robert Sheffy's life. I was wrong. Um, you know, so 
I thought, well, I'll see if someday I can afford to, to get one of these. Well, I found this thing. It's a, I think, first printing on um, copyright 1974 by Jess Carr. Yeah, it's a, it's a first printing. Um, right there is the book. It's, it was not in the best of shape, so I kind of patched it up up in here. You know, there and down there, it was all torn up. You can see it was ripped, and so I had to tape it like crazy. But that's the book right there. And uh, a few marks there in the thing. But, um, and, you know, studying the Methodist system uh, over the years, I've been so disheartened because, you know, they, there seemed to be some really good stuff that they would stand for back in the 1800s, especially. A lot of the bigger name Methodists, uh, Peter Cartwright, um, uh, Sam Jones, I thought was a good guy till I found out, I actually read the book about him and he's a, he was a high level Freemason and his wife that wrote the book, his, you know, biography, essentially, um, she bragged about the Freemason, uh, connections that he had. So, uh, not so good. And, you know, I, I heard some other things about the Methodist system and of course, Methodism right now is just awful. And so I often wondered, I wonder if Sheffy was a saved man. And it's always gnawed at me. And I thought, I tell so many people, you need to watch this film. It's such a blessing, you know. And, and I thought, I wonder if the guy was actually saved. I'd actually like to read the book. Well, bought it last year. Finally had a chance to read it. Um, I've been reading it in the morning when I get up. I start up the wood stove at our place. And then I'll sit there and read the book. And um, so... I'm going to share a bunch of things today. I'm actually going to show some of the movie in this video because I it's on YouTube. So I'm going to screen share. I'm going to show some of it. And um, and I'm going to show you what the actual quotes are from the book. So now I realize that, uh, you know, this is a biography. It's a biographical novel, actually. So he's he's added a lot of things that, you know, it's his own creativity, his own imagination. You can't say that these are the actual words of Robert Sheffy, but the point is the Sheffy movie says to have come from this book right here. So you can't say, well, you know, it's not the words of Sheffy, you know, whatever else. I'm not trying to treat the guy like it's scripture or something. Don't take me wrong. But the point is the movie was a blessing, but doesn't match up here because they said it did. And I'm going to show you it did not. Definitely did not. And, uh, yeah, amen, there, John, I see the comment, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Yeah, so um, I think of the, the other verse which talks about, you know, where Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and he says, you know, that uh, you garnish the tombs of, and, you know, essentially decorate the tombs of the righteous. But, you know, by your, your words and your deeds, you're, you're actually showing that you're the you know, offspring, I'm paraphrasing here, offspring of those that killed the prophets, you know, so very true of uh, Bob Jones University trying to eulogize a great man like Sheffy. And um, so we're going to get into it here. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to share the screen, I guess, and I'm going to play a few parts of the movie. For those who are not familiar with it, I'm familiar with it, very familiar with it, because it's I've watched the movie so many times. It's been a major part of, of uh, encouraging me in ministry and things. Um, so, all right, I'm going to do the screen, share screen thing. Uh, Green one, yeah. Hopefully I can. Hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound here and everything. I'll just wait till it comes up here on my other monitor. Okay, does everything look good there? I think you can still see me here. Okay, let me know if you can hear the audio. Blessing? But the campground will never be rebuilt, will it? Okay, did everybody hear that? Can you hear the audio? Good. 
Good. Okay. He, this young man, if you don't know the story, um, they had a campground meeting place, a big like revival, you know, place here. And way back in here, um, it gets burned down. And this young man here was one of the ones that burned it. So he comes to Sheffy right after the incident, which is not true. It happened a while after, uh, years after. But this young, in the actual book, this young man comes and he says, will the campground be rebuilt? Okay, that's where we're going to pick it up. I'm going to play the audio that they have Sheffy saying, and I'm going to actually read you the quote from the book. Okay, so let's play the audio of what Sheffy says. No. I used to think that it would be rebuilt. In fact, I thought I would do it. But that was only my own pride. My own pride. The campground is gone forever. God never forces his will on men. He calls them unto himself, but if they will not follow him, then they have to go their own way. The campground is gone. Not because you burned it, but because God's people didn't want it. And God let them have their own way. Every time we give up a part of our faith to try to fit into the ways of the world we lose it forever we lose a precious part of god's promise sacrifice to the world and the world will never give it back and someday when the world tells us we can no longer have our religion, except where they say, and God is driven from our schools and our government and our homes, then God's people can look back and know that our religion was not taken from us. It was given up, handed over, bit by bit, until there was nothing left. Okay. <laughs> so, very true. A lot of things are true, what he said there. But is that what Sheffy actually said in the book that they claimed? That this movie came from no that's not what Sheffy said this is page number 433 starting where he says the young man says will the campground ever be rebuilt Sheffy says no son the campground will never be rebuilt they got that part right but listen to this I am told that a new age has eaten freely from the tree of knowledge and that no more spirits live which need enrichment. See, what the whole story is about is the Methodist conference, the Methodist church was fighting Sheffy and other circuit riding preachers saying, we need to uh, educate people. We need to have institutions of higher learning and everything else. That was the real true story of Sheffy. He fought against the Methodist conference and they were trying to constantly get him in and say, you know, hey, you need to, you need to uh, um, join with us, and you're a great preacher and everything else. And he was fighting against them. He was fighting against the educational institutions of organized religion. I wonder why Bob Jones University wouldn't want to put that at the end of their film. Hmm. But he says, I am told the classroom will banish hate and hypocrisy. In other words, through education. That loneliness and need will wither in a coming intellect which promises to rise to greater heights than anything ever dreamed of at the Tower of Babel. That's what he said according to the book, okay, which they say the movie is based on. So what do we have? The people 
at Bob Jones University completely lied about what Sheffy really said. Hmm. Very interesting. But it doesn't stop there. They did it throughout the whole movie. They twisted so much of this man's life and so much of what he did and what he accomplished and whatever else. And again, it's not just little details or things. It is literally timelines of his life in certain years. He did whatever. And Bob Jones University totally lied about it and had him doing things just all mixed up throughout the years and whatever else. It doesn't even match the book even close. It's just crazy. Another one of the uh, things, one of the scenes, um, if you know the story, his aunt he has a wealthy aunt and um, and she uh, she basically humiliates him, you know, calls him out for going to a revival meeting, which we'll talk about that in just a minute. And he and he leaves and and um, and he comes back and uh, to his home or his aunt's home. She's a very wealthy lady and everything. And uh, she leaves this sheepskin for him to prey on. And basically, um, you know, she says that she got saved. Let's watch this part here. And I'm going to read the actual truth of what really happened there. I have to find it here quick, but um, yeah, there it is. She leaves a note and they, they write what's in the note and it doesn't even come close to, well, it comes a little bit close, but they don't, again, they, they lie about it. Well, let's watch this scene. The scene. I get it out. Dear Robert, the sheep is honored by God for its meekness. Ride upon the sheepskin, Robert. Pray upon it. And remember the humility of the sheep. You were right. My values were misplaced. God has shown me the only thing of true value in this world is salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. I have accepted him as my savior. May you continue to follow the Lord and serve him faithfully all your life. Kind regards, Aunt Elizabeth. Yeah, you know, a very touching scene. You think, wow, she got saved because he... He, you know, left and she was just kind of a high church woman. She didn't get saved. Not for one second. Here's the actual note that she wrote to him. Page 181 of the saint in the wilderness. Sir. Saint of the wilderness. I keep saying in. <laughs> saint of the wilderness. Page 181. Here's what she writes. The sheep is the meekest and most vulnerable of God's creatures. But perhaps its very humility and helplessness is why it is honored of God and man. The lost sheep needs not only rescue, but to remember it is still a sheep. Ride upon this sheepskin, Robert. Pray upon it. Sleep upon it. And remember the humbleness of the animal from whose back it came. Now they got close. Okay. They, they got a little bit close there with what they you know said in the film and what's actually written. But check this out. I to will do penitence. She's dead. Okay. She's give this to him after give this to Robert after I die and he comes back, you know, to see me. I too will do penitence. What is that? Purgatory. Uh, she didn't. I have accepted Jesus as Christ as my savior. That's not in here. I will do penitence. I have left in my burial instructions that the oldest dress I have and the one surviving garment I possess from my first days in Abingdon, Abingdon, Virginia, now Malthaton and Bear, be used on my body as I am laid to rest. I cannot go out of the world naked as I came into it, but for my part, I will do the next best thing. Elizabeth Wilson White. Uh, yeah, um, that's a lie. She didn't get saved. But see, Bob Jones University has to change the actual story to make it more tear jerking and more of a sell for people. I just, you know, I couldn't believe it reading the book. And I thought, what in the world? You know, this just awful. So, um, but I want to hit a couple other points here. I, I'm really kind of thinking 
I should almost write up an article on this or something, you know, just to warn people, you know, um, you know, and, and, and by the way, I see over here in the, uh, you know, comments and things, I mean, talking about eating pork and whatever else, you know, some other time. Okay. You know, we're talking about a movie here. If you're not interested, do something else. But, you know, I need to make a few points on this movie because it's so important. Um, because I went into this thing and, and with a with just saying, OK, Lord, if this man is lost, I want to know about it. Um, you show me if he's lost, if he's saved. I'd like to know. OK, um, if you watch the, the movie back in about here, he's out a revival meeting. He comes forward, he gets saved. I'm not going to play much more of the movie, whatever else. But um, and he goes home and he tells his all of his relative relatives about it and they're all you know closing their eyes and whole brother he got saved at a revival meeting and you know his aunt you know rebukes him for it um it's not what happened uh he talks to this older preacher that part is accurate um but it, you know he basically it, it doesn't really go into the thing of him taking him through the scriptures or whatever else that's not even there either and i was kind of leaning a little bit towards I don't know because he, he really didn't talk much about what was the gospel that was preached. You know, what did Sheffy say? You know, whatever. But uh, it says here, you know, he comes back. He said, I'm going to come back. This old preacher, he says, I'll come back in the spring and be baptizing people and whatever. And then I can, you know, uh, talk to you then. But let's listen, listen to this line here. Page 58. He told no one in his household about his conversion. Hmm. But the movie here has him getting, uh, you know, yelled at basically by his aunt. He didn't tell her. He didn't tell anybody about the uh, conversion. So, um, he actually, and, and you know, that then after this whole thing here in the movie, he goes riding off, you know, he leaves home and he goes riding off and he goes to this revival meeting thing, helps a guy get saved, gets a job as a school teacher right there. The guy gives him a job, you know, and then he goes and, and he's uh, staying with this older woman in this apartment thing, which did happen. But the thing of going to a Baptist church happened a long time later. Um, Sheffy actually yoked up with a lost guy. Um, named he nicknamed him Yancey Doc. His last name was Yancey, and he was a doctor. And uh, they went out, and there was a cholera outbreak in this one settlement. And Sheffy was helping him with, you know, preparing dead bodies or whatever. Met a Moravian uh, preacher, and uh, you know, he was with this. Sheffy was with this very, very wicked doctor. The doctor ended up getting shot in the back because he was trying to fornicate with a guy's wife, and the guy was dying of cholera and the guy got up out of bed and shot this doctor in the back and you know i mean chef he didn't go off and start going to church right away okay um he hid his conversion for a long time page 101 robert thought of his own conversion and how quietly and serenely his own being was being changed he had as yet talked deeply to no one about it in the sense of what it meant to him he had hoped to do so with his Aunt Elizabeth, and casually he had mentioned it to Yancey Doc, but his friend had cut him off with a def definite signal of disinterest. So again, the movie has him getting saved and just boom, right into ministry. You know, didn't happen. Okay. And, you know, you think, oh, that's bad. Oh, man, I don't know if he got saved. Oh, uh, well, by the end of the book, if you read the book ever, you'll see, yeah, he definitely was a saved man. There's no question about that. But I find it encouraging because you look at this man and you think, wow, what a powerful man of God. Well, he was, but it took years. Amen. You know, it wasn't right away. He made some big mistakes early on in his walk with the Lord. He made some very big mistakes. Okay. So I, I found that actually to be a little bit more <laughs> endearing, you might say, because you know, you watch the movie and you just think, man, I could never measure up to a guy like this. I mean, he's just something else. Um, I'm not going to go through all the movie and, and whatever else and show 
all the many times that it was just, uh, you know, um, they you know, definitely lied about the actual book. But uh, just another thing I wanted to, I think I'm going to go over two more quotes here in the book. But um, page two, 272 um, says here, the Sunday night service was all that remained. Not one message from the pulpit brought one healthy Methodist shout, much less a con convert. And finally, Robert was asked to close the meeting with a short prayer. Okay. What was going on there? He was invited to some um, uh, big conference where all the big Methodist, you know, uh, conference leaders and heads of the Methodist church were at. They did ordain him actually too. That's another thing. It's in the book. Um, he did get his license to preach. Uh, the, the scene where, you know, he's, he's at some, at this stuffy guy's place, you know, and he's trying to get permission to, to be a preacher. Uh, see where it's at. Yeah, right there. This scene where he's um, trying to get that right there. This is the Methodist elder right here at the Methodist conference place. And he's trying to get his license to preach. And they make it look like he didn't get a license. Actually, he did. He did get a license to preach. Not at that time. He was rejected. But because of his work, they gave him a license to preach. So, again, they lied about that in the movie. Another thing. but. Uh, um, he was invited to this big conference, but because he wasn't one of the, uh, they literally use the word fraternity in here, the the higher up guys in the Methodist conference, because of that, they wouldn't give him an opportunity to, to stand up and preach, um, even though he was very well known among the people. But they finally gave him a chance to close in prayer at this big conference. But, uh, you know, they asked him to close with a short prayer which old time Methodists didn't know what a short prayer was. <laughs> but it says here, he stood, lifted his sheepskin prayer mat from the chair on which he was sitting and walked to the front near the altar. There he knelt facing the congregation and lifted his voice. Dear Lord, a chill wind seems to imprison our hearts and the brothers and sisters sit about as rotting tree stumps. And even the mouths of thy servants who have spoken seem cold with formality and aloofness. These brethren who call themselves preachers and who by divine calling should let thy loving kindness shine from them like the light of sun of the sun do not know what the trouble is. They can't figure out why the services aren't going good in other words. I think I know what the trouble is. Thou art not with us. We have not invited thee. They will not like thy servant Robert Sheffy for asking you this at so late an hour. But Lord, come quickly like a descending dove. Forgive them, Lord. For their stiff shirt collars and brand new suits make it hard for them to look down from the pulpit to see if anyone stands at the altar. Forgive them, Lord. They are small potatoes and very few in the hill. <laughs> so, uh, shook things up a little bit. And uh, another one I, I thought was pretty funny, too. Um, the guy was very sarcastic, in other words. Which I get, you know, people attack me all the time for that. And I think you really ought to study some of the old preachers. I'm mild compared to some of these guys. So Sheffy is at another uh, revival meeting. And he says here, um, again, it's not going so well. And he says, uh, well, now we're all dressed up and seated comfortably here together. So let us not waste the night. Somebody should gain from our effort. I think we ought to pray for the devil. If the sweet Lord can't make any headway, there's no reason at all. Why old Satan can't have a good night of it. Bow with me now. <laughs> and then he prays, Oh, mighty Satan, giver of power and God of lust and pride. Look how many of us await your next command. <laughs> there, there are all sizes and shapes and varieties of us ready and obedient. Notice the fancy dressed lady near the back pew with the hat that looks like a dead chicken. She's not close to the Lord at all. Her pastor told me so. I believe she's already in your camp. Now the old man sitting next to the aisle, you'd think you didn't have a chance with him, but he's hiding from the Lord for over 70 years. And he's been hiding right here in the church. He's yours. You can put him on your roll and add some more fuel to the lake of fire. Now we don't mean to be giving you the old cast off Satan. There are those in their prime who will spend eternity with you. Notice the young, the young unmarried girl with straw collared hair hunched down almost out of sight about halfway back. She has been eating too many green apples and her belly is swollen powerfully bad. She must be infecting herself, Brother Lucifer, for the same thing has happened to her four times before. But we won't send her alone. 
The father, uh, the father of one or maybe all of her children is sitting on the opposite side like he didn't know her. They've been so close in life, it would be a pity that death would separate them. Oh, mighty Satan, there's so many we could point out to you, but you have them all down anyway. You must excuse us for being poor losers tonight. Somehow our hearts are not as happy as when one lost soul, one baby lamb lost sheep comes bleeding into the fold of your adversary. <laughs> so I uh, just thought that was pretty funny. But, um, you know, just the way these guys were so sarcastic back then, you know, people were a lot more clear with the way that they spoke, you know, and, and you know, I get I get attacked all the time for that. You know, you're so sarcastic. You don't have any love. You don't smile ever. That's my favorite one. I don't ever know how to smile or whatever else. So, um, but so, you know, there's just so many scenes I could go over in this movie where, you know, this one here, even they, they had a, a black servant woman right there and her name was, or Anna or whatever. I forget how they it was Anna or Anna. And uh, she was sold uh, because the family went, fell into hard times. And when he came home, there was a new servant woman. So they lied about that. Um, this scene right here, he goes and he stays with his family and their daughter, Eliza, right there. Um, they, they mixed up that whole thing up so much. She did get married to him, um, and they had their son, Eddie. That is true. But Sheffy was married um, and had six children before meeting her. And so, and his first wife's name was Elizabeth. So kind of interesting there. He got married to two different Elizabeths and his aunt was named Elizabeth. So apparently had a thing for women named Elizabeth, but, uh, um, the, the courtship thing was just, again, they, they totally changed details to it. Um, you know, right here, uh, there's a scene where this guy, um, yeah, see if I can get it here a little bit better. Uh, I can't get to the scene and show the, the young guy, but he basically, um, okay, you can kind of see him right there, but they go out on the porch and he says, my Paul talked about you. And he said that he was a moonshiner and a, and a tree came down and smashed his still and he got saved. The guy didn't get saved. Again, they lied about that. Um, in the actual book, the moonshiner, yes, the tree did come down and smash the still. But he was actually leaving town and Sheffy saw him and, and he was all weirded out by Sheffy. Get away from me. You know, he didn't get saved. So this actual scene here was another moonshine moonshiner. And that moonshiner actually, you know, that Sheffy came and prayed and said, I pray that your still is digged up and everything and, and knocked over. And some guys came and did that. But again, the guy didn't get saved. So th there's this. You know, adding this evangelistic type of stuff in there that Bob Jones University did. And it wasn't true. It, it was not accurate to the story. Um, this scene right here where Sheffy basically takes off his socks and gives them to a, a young man who's in it's in the wintertime. And the young guy's going to a mill to get work. That happened. That's true, according to the story. But then he goes and he comes to the home of the Staffords with Elizabeth Stafford right there. And she makes these socks for him or whatever else. And uh, here, this is these socks are to replace yours. Not true. Not true. Again, it was another uh, family that Sheffy went and stayed with. And the woman of the house made socks for him. So, and he was married to Eliza at that point in time. So just so many details. And I think why? You know, why did they have to change the story? It would have been just as good. Why did they have to mix things up? I mean, Sheffy did some amazing work. He really, really did. Uh, he was a great man. The scene here, the the infamous, uh, um, you know, where he takes this uh, old drunk. See if I can get to it here. Um, he takes him up and he puts him in the, you know, in this tub or whatever of alcohol and um goes up on top of this hill and puts a tub of alcohol and, and then he drops this drunk down into it and he puts branches all around it and, and lights it on fire you know not the actual guy burning but you know to cure this guy from being a drunkard um he used his horse to haul the the 
branches and the tub and all the other stuff and the guy up on top of the hill. Now, you know, as a filmmaker, I can understand why you would say, all right, you know, that's going to be a little bit hard to film that. We'll just, instead of using a horse to haul that stuff up, we'll just have the actor playing Sheffy hauling the stuff up. Okay. I get that. Not a real big deal, but you know, just so many different things where, you know, this one here, um, this one happened where the, he prays and he gives these people his horse that happened that one they they did pretty accurately again they would follow it sometimes they followed his life sometimes but uh you know the the thing of you know he puts this he gets this uh horse that's never been never been broken or anything yet and um you know calls him gideon second time he calls a horse gideon and uh that one you know yeah that happened so um just trying to think if there's anything else i want to say here uh but you know there's a scene from when he was older and his wife's older and everything else and the tyler and fraser there in the background um and they were talking about you know they're not going to have a meeting the one year and that was true again it was a struggle between you know the circuit riding preachers that were saying we need to get people saved we need to get them together and whatever, you know, forget about universities, let's get people saved. And the Methodist conference was saying, no, we need to, we need to educate these people. And there was fighting back and forth. That friction was there. That is in the book. Um, but my one point, and I need to make this, um, with Sheffy, uh, and this is one area I disagree with him very much in, and that is the thing of the guy was gone all the time. I mean, a lot of his children to his first marriage, he wasn't even there when they were born. He was out doing the Lord's work, you know, witnessing to people and doing good for people. And he would give people the coat off of his back, literally. I mean, he would just, he fought and fought and fought and fought and fought, you know, for what he believed to be the Lord's calls. And he would go out and do the rounds, you know, just ride hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. He was a tough man, very, very tough man. And I respect that in some ways. But when you are a married man, you have to take care of your wife. And you don't just say, well, Paul did this and Jesus did that. Uh, they were single. Okay. If you're going to go and ride all over the wilderness and be some kind of great evangelist, then you stay single. Okay. And you get married, if you make the decision to get married, young man out there, um, you take care of your wife. Okay, you provide for your own. And they had a lot of financial difficulties as well. And they had to borrow money from other people and things because Sheffy was always out on the road and he was always giving money away to people and things like that. You don't do that. Okay. And that was a big challenge to me because there are a lot of times I have pushed a little bit too hard with the ministry and I don't spend much time with my wife and my son. And, um, you know, it, it's, you see the Lord doing things and you, and you feel that urge to, oh, I got to preach about this. I'm going to preach about that. And I want to do more work for the Lord, but I'm married and I have to take care of my wife and, and my son. And that's just the way it is. And there's sometimes I just have to say, you know what? Uh, the world doesn't revolve around me. OK, the world doesn't revolve around you, Christian. Um, God's going to get his work done. And I'm not saying to just not witness to people and just whatever. No, you, you need to witness. You need to preach the gospel when you can. But uh, God's plans are still going to be there and they're still going to happen. And I do believe, you know, they, they kind of did talk about a little bit here in, in the end of the movie, which they, they did do a good job of covering it, where he said it was my own pride that was making me think I was going to get the campground rebuilt and whatever else. Robert Sheffy did have, I'm going to say Robert Breaker. <laughs> not this, not even in the same category here, but um, Robert Sheffy did have a lot of pride. Um, I knew a preacher the one time uh, that he, you know, was staying with this Liberty Baptist church effort of Pennsylvania. His name was Guy Mosebrook. And he, talked to a, a friend of mine, brother of mine, and he said, uh, 
do you think I have a pride issue? And that's why I'm not walking away from this church. And uh, Brother Jesse, at the time he said, uh, yeah, that's exactly it. Your pride is keeping you from walking away from this. And, um, you know, and because he knew when he left, it was going to go to, there were two guys in the in the church that were going there that wanted to take over and they're going to turn it into a very charismatic type of thing. And he said, you know, he was trying to preserve the legacy of the, the great Liberty Baptist church where Jack Hiles once pre once preached and Jerry Falwell preached there. And they had a big Christian school and, you know, thousands of members, I guess it was thousands. I forget now, but it was a lot of people went there and it just fell apart and just kept on splintering and fracturing and whatever else. And he was there and out of pride, he was saying, I got to keep this thing going. And the guy was sacrificing his family time. He was sacrificing his money, his health, just to keep this thing going. And it just, nope, got to walk away. And that you're all, everybody out there is going to get to that point where you realize that, that, you know, okay, Lord, I, I'd love to work in this thing more, but I just can't. I'm just one person. I can't keep doing this. Um, I mean, we are, you got to remember what the scriptures say. The scripture will not be broken. God's word stands. Anything in this that's a prophecy, it's pre recorded history. I heard a preacher say that one time. I thought that was great. Um, you know, I mean, I'm going to stop sharing the thing here now. Um, okay. I think I'm back to that again. Um, any prophecy in the scriptures is going to come to pass, regardless of what you do. Um, the Bible says the road that leads to hell is broad, and many there be which go in there at. Okay. Um, you're not going to change that. You're just not. Well, I want to get, I'm going to get people saved. I'm going to get, you know, I hear these preachers and they'll say, uh, bless God. Well, I'm going to get everybody saved in my state. I'm going to, I'm going to get, bring revival. You're not going to bring revival. You're not going to bring everybody, get everybody saved. It's not going to happen. Why? Because the Bible says it wouldn't happen that way. Uh, we're going to have a great revival. The Bible says there's a falling away in the end times. The church age, if you want to call up that, and I realize it's somewhat problematic because there's church references to church in the Old Testament, references, refer, references to church in the time of Jacob's trouble. But for sake of argument, the time that the body of Christ is on the earth before the catching up, it ends in a falling away, regardless of what we do. So I say, well, that's really negative. Well, it's negative, but it's also very positive, okay, because it puts less pressure on you. This Baptist thing of, um, you know, you just got to win souls, man. When's the last time you won a soul to Jesus Christ? You got to just be winning people every week. If you're not winning 50 people a week, then something's wrong with you. You know, just whoa, hold on a second there. You know, the end times are compared to the days of Noah. You know, the Bible says about that. Jesus Christ said that in Matthew chapter 24. Eight people, eight people got saved. Family members. Eight people. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness, the Bible calls it. So, you know, I, I know I've been in the Bible believing movement for a long time now. I've corresponded with a lot of people over the years. We're lonely. Uh, there's not many of us. We're discouraged, you know. Yeah, uh, it's, it's not going to get any better. Okay, that's the way it's supposed to be. It gets better when the Lord says, come up hither, right? So what do you do? What do you do in your life? Well, you say, okay, Lord, um, this is not going to be me, okay? This time is gone. Riding around on horseback and, and being able to witness to people and preach the gospel to people like Sheffy did and, and whatever else. I mean, he, some of the stuff this guy did, <laughs> this book, I mean, you do that stuff today, it'd be hate crime, it'd be terrorism. I'll tell you one story. I'm not going to look it up in here, but there was a brothel. He went to this town and he was shocked that there was a brothel there, this whorehouse, you know. And and um, and so he paid a bunch of teenagers to go over to an apple orchard. There was a wasp nest hanging there. And he said, go on over, stick a corn cob into the hole there where the wasps come in and out. Cut the wasp nest down and bring it to me and I'll pay you good money for it. And these teenagers, you know, he did it on dairy. He said, I bet you won't do it. You know, and teenagers being what they are, they said, oh, yeah, 
we'll do it. And they brought this thing back and he paid him the money. He said, thank you. And he walked over and there was a around behind the, the brothel on the back part of the street. There was a window open. And so he takes this hornet nest and it's, they're very angry in there. And he chucks this hornet nest into the, the brothel and it hits the floor and just explodes and breaks open and the horns just come flying out. And he slams the window down and starts walking away. And he said he could hear the screams of men and women both in there coming out, you know. <laughs> so I me mean, try that today. I mean, you know, not going to happen. You know, this this we're not going back to that again. That time's gone. Um, so what do you do? Well, you you just say, OK, Lord, I know what your word says. I know that it's the falling away. I know that there aren't many people that are going to get saved, but help me day to day. Lord, help me to get closer to you through this book right here. And give me opportunities. Open up doors, Lord. There's, we're still here, so somebody still needs to get saved. So, Lord, open up those doors for me. Give me those opportunities. Help me to lay down a gospel track someplace. Maybe help me to give it to somebody. If I see somebody and, and tell me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, say, there, give them a track. Open up a conversation. Bring some false professing Christian to me to try to witness to me and I get to witness to them actually and show them that they're not really saved, you know, like Jehovah's Witnesses or or some modern charismatics or something like that. You know, um so you know the lesson I learned from reading this book is just the thing of you know finding that balance there. I mean I'm gonna read a verse of scripture here as I'm turning I'll keep turning first Corinthians chapter seven. Um, you have to find a balance working for the Lord. That's so important. Um, uh, let's see here. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness for he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay. Um, if you're a single guy, um, I would always keep the, the the thought open of, okay, Lord, if you want me to get married, then you bring the wife to me. You make it just plain. I'm living proof of that. 36 years of my life, I lived as a single guy. I was in ministry for a few years in there. And um, certainly put a lot of time into study and research and things. Um, and I just thought there's no way I'm ever going to get married. You know, I, I don't know if I ever told this story in a sermon or not, but there were actually, there was a woman, a Mennonite, some Mennonite sect or something like that. And they, she contacted me and she said, I have two single daughters and, and, you know, they're kind of trying to arrange this marriage thing with, with me and whatever. And she said, um, you know, they're both around your age and whatever, a little bit younger, not too much younger, a couple of years. And she said, would you be interested in them? And I said, well, you know, I'd like to talk to them. You know, we'll see how it goes. And she said, okay. And she said, I'm going to talk to them and they'll, they'll, you know, um, I'll show them what you do and, you know, your ministry and whatever else. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And so uh, she writes back a few days later. I'm so sorry. I am just so sorry. <laughs> uh, neither one of them is interested. They, they both think that you're too militant. <laughs> So I, I kind of thought, all right, well, single life, you know, here we go. And um, uh, try the single online Christian dating thing. I recommend very much against that, uh, especially nowadays. I mean, it's gotten much worse since, you know, when I first was, you know, this is early 2000s, you know. And uh, and I remember this, uh, I got on this one website and it, it had this thing of, you know, type in your beliefs and your feelings and then we'll find your perfect match. And it was, you know, tens of thousands of people registered on this website. You know, you will find, we will find your perfect match. And so I typed in all my beliefs to their questions and whatever. I thought oh, this should be interesting. Came up zero results. <laughs> so nobody liked me. And I thought, oh, okay, there, there goes that chance. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, the Lord uh, brought my wife in, into my life. And um, she's been a real great help with the ministry. and. You know, what can I say? Uh, 
Lord gave us our son too, and that's been another great blessing. I never thought that that would have happened. I mean, I thought, well, the rapture is going to happen. There's not enough time. Brethren, we don't know how much time is left. But uh, if you're single, um, male or female, you wait on the Lord. Take my advice. Um, do not try to get out there and find somebody. Okay, that's a bad idea. You just you get your head in this book and you study this book and you say, okay, Lord, I want to hide your word in my heart. I want to I want to just immerse myself in the scriptures. And if you decide to get me married, say it that way, you arrange the marriage, Lord. I want an arranged marriage that you set up. I don't want to try to do it. I don't want to try to arrange a marriage. You know, I remember I, I did try a couple of times. I'd see some pretty girl at some store or whatever, and I'd think, yeah, I'm going to go ask her out. You know, I'd go in there, and I'd ask for, well, she doesn't work here anymore. Okay. You know, <laughs> I tried a couple of times. Just, the Lord just shot them down each time. And, all right. You know. <laughs> but see, the whole thing is the Lord knew my heart. He knew I wanted his will. That was the difference there. He controlled my life when he saved me. And I thank him for that because, boy, I sure would have made a mess in my life had uh, I had my way. I didn't, you know, if he had let me have my way. So if you're single, just search the scriptures, study the scriptures. Um, but if you're married, here's the point of the Sheffy book. If you are married and the Lord's given you children, especially, you owe them your time. You provide for them. And that does, doesn't just mean that you have to make a really big salary and have a really nice car and nice house and whatever else. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. I've known a lot of rich people over the years that their children were very unhappy and uh, turned to drugs and alcohol and all kinds of things because their dad and mom were always working. And they had a lot of money. Um, that isn't what the Bible means by providing for your own. Um, you have to be there for them. Uh, there's times I'm sitting on the floor. Uh, I have work to do or whatever else, but my, my son wants to play with his Legos or some other thing like that. And I need to give him that time. Um, there's times when I want to get a job done and my son wants to help me. And I have to kind of say, I really need to get this job done, but I need to teach Oliver. You have to sacrifice when you get married. There's times when my wife needs to talk and I want to go to sleep. I don't want to stay up. I'm tired, but she needs to talk to me. Stay up. Sacrifice. That was the problem over here. This man loved the Lord very, very much. Uh, after reading the book, I am I was just so blessed by this book. It was such a neat thing to read. But he disobeyed the scriptures. And he was not a lost man. Uh, he just pushed so hard. And um, he killed his first wife, essentially. I mean, with, with just being gone all the time. And she just, she got weaker and weaker and weaker each time they had a child. And and by the time they had their fifth child, it was, you probably don't want to have any more children here. I mean, she can barely stand up and whatever else. And they had another child. And she died basically in her bed. And they said she just after she gave birth to their sixth child, she just was there and she just, the blood just kept coming out of her uh, in the childbirthing process. She basically bled to death. And why? Well, because she had to do all the housework. She had family that would come over and help and things, but it was, there was so much responsibility. I mean, she had five children, five children and Sheffy's out preaching the gospel, out riding around, you know, and, and talking to people and whatever else. And I've been down south, too, by the way, you southerners. I know there's a lot of idle talk that goes on, you know, about the weather and about, did you hear so-and-so got the new tractor? And, you know, I have relatives that live in West Virginia. Okay, I know. And that was the range where Sheffy was, West Virginia and Virginia, and a little bit out around, too. But, but uh, I know about the idle talk. Okay, and I'm sure that there was plenty of idle talk. It wasn't all witnessing that the man did. But I understand what I'm saying. Your heart can be right. Your heart can be for the Lord, but you're pushing too hard. And you're making it a pride thing where you're saying, you know what? It's all about me. 
it's all about I am God's man or God's woman or whatever. And I'm just if if I am sick and I, if I don't spend my day out there witnessing, God's plans are gonna be frustrated for the day because his man's not out there or something. No, no, no. Uh, you're not that important. I'm not that important. Nobody's that important. So that's the lesson I learned from the Sheffy uh, actual book. Um, very in, very encouraging to read a story of a great man like that, but uh, a great reminder to me, kind of a kick from the Lord. Uh, don't get too stuck on yourself. You know, don't think that you're that important. You know, the book, like that. Not me, it's the book. So that pretty much ends my thing here. I don't know if I should write anything about this or whatever else, the fine points and, and details and whatever else. Um, I don't know uh, if I should, you know, compile something about this, you know, here. Uh, I know this is a first edition. I don't know if they've changed, you know, they printed, reprinted it a couple times. I don't know if it's been changed. I haven't read the other books on uh, Sheffy. And um, I know the other thing too is I know, um, you know, a lot of people down south, they, you know, there's a lot of talk and they, they tell the stories of Sheffy and whatever. And that's what he, Jess Carr, said he grew up hearing all these legends about this, this uh, Robert Sheffy guy. And, and so he finally compiled the book about him. So, um, okay, there's a two, 2018 edition. That's interesting. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know. I've, you know, it, it's going to be kind of hard to find the actual what he really was and what he really did and whatever else, because it's just going to be a lot of people's stories that have been passed down, I think. Um, and I think there's a reason for that, too. You know, kind of like the paintings of Jesus. There are no paintings of Jesus <laughs> because he wasn't about to sit still and, and, OK, paint me, you know, or something. That's not the Lord. Um, I mean, and he had a right to do it because he's God. Holy, completely God, you know, Lord God Almighty. Uh, he would have had a right to pose for paintings, but he wasn't about to do it. And, you know, Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh that was given to him, lest he should be exalted above measure. Got that backwards, actually. But, you know, you just don't want to get too big. So, but anyhow, so I think what we'll do here, um, since I covered that, um, and still, you know, I still recommend the movie. I will say that in closing here. I still do recommend the movie, but um, just remember it's not true to the book. They added an awful lot of things there, and there are a lot of things that just were a lie, plain and simple, that they changed. So, um, <clears throat> so anyhow, uh, I think what we're going to do is. Uh, I think we'll do some questions. If anybody wants to ask me some questions. Um, so we'll just open up the questions here. You can post your questions and I'll try to answer them. Questions on anything. And uh, try my best. You can ask questions too. It doesn't have to be scripture stuff. You know, you can just ask me a question if you've always wondered about whatever else. Okay. Um, okay, okay, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. Um, question, Brother Brian, with all due respect, I don't know it is, is it is okay to paraphrase Bible verses, you should read it from the Bible or memorize it correctly. Just a thought. Well, I agree with that, you know, you try to quote it as best you can. Um, I, I know what you're saying. I'm just trying to give a, the, the basics of it. But yeah, you're right. I should definitely be saying turn in your Bible, but just trying to just go off of memory here. Um, okay. Uh, 
um, an advice for being a filmmaker. Well, I don't really consider myself to be a filmmaker. I don't really get into a lot of things like that. Um, if you're going to just do videos for talking about the Lord, you don't really have to make them real fancy. You don't want to entertain people. Um, any German Martin Luther? Any German Martin Luther biographies you recommend? No, I don't really have any. In all honesty, there's some different ones out there, Heroes of the Faith or something like that, but. There's a lot of issues with Martin Luther. Um, I'm much farther back in the video. Do you understand the difference between true story versus based on a true story? That the movie the movie claimed to be a true story, then one could complain about quotes. Yeah, I understand that. But you can see that there's an agenda behind why they're not quoting Sheffy. Because Robert Sheffy was ripping on the whole Bible University thing. And it was a Bible University that came out with the movie. So that's why I'm making a stink about it. And, you know, I think when it comes to something that's put out by Christians, I think it, you know, uh, put out by Christians, it should be pretty close to the truth. Um, okay. Uh, Victoria, um, is there any tourism or foundations affiliated with Robert Sheffy operating today? Well, I actually heard. Um, one of the things that inspired this Jess Carr to write the book about Sheffy was he actually saw people going to the little church out in the country down in Virginia where Robert Sheffy's gravestone is. And so people would actually go there and, and just go to his gravesite or whatever else. A lot of people respect him. Um, okay. I am doing gardening and chickens, brother. For your other channel, are you going to be doing things like that? Well, probably eventually. We have uh, some animals in the area that uh, also would like chickens as well. So uh, we're going to need to do, you know, I, I have to get a place built first and then um, maybe we'll get chickens eventually. But I'm going to have to have lots of ways to protect them. Okay. Um, Brother John here. Uh, Question. I'm still hoping that someone can provide the link to the website of the brother that converts all your videos to mp3 audios. I listen to them while I drive. Uh, okay. Let me think here where I would have that. Um, hmm. Trying to think here if I can find that real quick. That's no, not there. Uh, Yard. I'll have to try to see if I can find it real quick. I said I was going to do that. So, um, yeah. Give me a minute here. Find down there audio. There it is. Um, I don't know how up to date it is. Um, I'll post it down here in the comments, brother. Right there. Hopefully, that should be it. Right there. There's the link. Like I said, I don't know how up to date it is. Um, okay. Question Brian Denlinger Can divorced people get remarried? Yeah, I did a sermon on that. Um, it depends on the divorce, essentially. If, uh, if some guy, um, Basically, if he's married and his wife leaves him and, and she joins her body to another man for vacation, um, then I do believe that you can get remarried in that context. I have a whole study on that. Get through the all through the scriptures on that. So, uh, let's see here. Brian, your thoughts were that underage children will be raptured before time of Jacob's trouble. Doesn't Matthew twenty four say otherwise? Since it says, "Woe well, unto them that are with child," that assumes some ch children are left. Good point. Very good point. But let me just point out a, a something here. Matthew chapter 24, the verse says, um, uh, see if I can find it here quickly. 
but uh, verse 19, but woe unto them that are with child and, and to them that give suck in those days. So you have a nursing baby that's usually till about two years old. So that could happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. The, the catching up happens. And of course, they're going to have children after that happens. You know, the Lord doesn't catch up all the children at the rapture. We'll just use that term to prove the point here. The Lord doesn't catch up all the children, rapture them up and then make everybody sterile. They can still have children. So <clears throat> I do believe that children are going to go up. Um, Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, appreciate your ministry being been following you since the beginning. Just wondering why you are talk bad. I guess you're why do I talk bad about Ruckman and his graduates being I am one? A great job on a tribute video. Well, take it for what it's worth. It's constructive criticism. Um, I'm a defender of Peter Ruckman, right there. You can see the Ruckman reference Bible. Um, been very greatly blessed by Peter Ruckman. Um, but Ruckman is not the authority. Okay, that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. Brian Denlinger is not the authority. Uh, nobody is the authority. The Bible is the authority. And a lot of graduates of PBI have gone on to do some really heretical things because they worshipped Peter Ruckman. If you know, if you've been down there, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of the guys down there and they, you know, really emulate Peter Ruckman. And you have a guy like Robert Breaker that just basically is a heretic and he just uses Ruckman's material to make himself look legitimate. And when he comes out with his own stuff, it's heretical. So um, Gene Kim basically, you know, rejected Ruckman's advice. And where Ruckman, I, it's in his uh, question and answer um, series, I have it on cassette tape going back quite a ways. And he said, a lot of my young men go out of here and they start talking about all the abstract parts of the Bible. And he said, you can't base a ministry on that. You have to preach doctrine. That's what you have to do. And Gene Kim goes out. We call him Clickbait Kim here. And, and he goes out and he's preaching, the, you know, uh, alien blood is green and, and the connection to Catholic communion or something. And you know, what? What is this? But see, he gets views that way. And he gets money from monetization. That's what I'm trying to say. It's about the Bible. Okay. Not trying to tear down Ruckman or whatever else. I'm not saying he's a false and he's not saved and whatever. I'm not. Um, so. Are you a Mason? Uh, I saw you do hand signs a few times. Uh, honestly, I have an older brother and he was a pretty good uh, stone Mason. I mean, he built stone chimneys and things. Me personally, I've never been a good Mason. So, uh, no, I'm not a Freemason, okay? Uh, I have made it clear that uh, somebody, if, if I go like this, ditch my face or something, and I put my fingers down and I go like that, but, oh, they take a screenshot. Oh, he's saluting Satan. You know, Peter Ruckman would go like this. He'd, he'd grip a piece of chalk and he would go like that and he'd talk out to the crowd like that. And people would say, oh, look, he's doing the devil salute. People, that's not the way it works. And I've said this. And some people don't seem to get it. If some guy's posing and doing a, a clear satanic hand signal and it's a picture in some publication, that's where you say, uh oh. But if you're pausing a video, waiting and just clicking frame by frame till you get the person kind of doing a little bit of that doesn't work. Okay. I'm not a Freemason. Okay. Definitely not a Freemason. Uh, question. After I gave you my thoughts about calling people out, brother, I failed to ask your view and whether or not God directs you uh, differently at times. Um, yeah. Uh, there are times when it, hmm, this, this is a rough subject for me because there are times I realize people are just trying to mess with me and there's, there's so much this little 
psychological stuff that goes on in on YouTube, especially, uh, you know, and and sometimes I've done things just to kind of shake people up or whatever else, kind of like Elijah did with the priests of Baal, um, you know, and you can you can kind of do that and it shows some people's real character and whatever else. There's times I've acted out my flesh and I shouldn't have done it and I shouldn't have gotten mad and whatever else. Some people know how to get under my skin, but, you know, I'm thankful for those times actually because it's, it's taught me some things and it's, it's taught me to be more, more calm and more level headed and just kind of go, okay, they're going to play this game again. All right. I fell for it the first time, but I'm not going to fall for it again. You know, okay, you're going to make a fake channel about me and I can go to YouTube and YouTube will take your channel down. No, they won't. Um, by the way, I appealed the video that uh, was taken down uh, by YouTube because it was hate speech because I was condemning Steven Anderson, the hate colonel that he is. And um, they wrote back and they said, sorry, we're not going to tell you what, wh how you offended or whatever else. Um, we're taking your video down. You did hate speech. You're guilty of hate speech. But we're just not going to tell you what the hate speech was. Kind of like getting pulled over by a police officer and he says, you're under arrest. I say, why is that? Not going to tell you. Okay, this is fair, you know, police wouldn't do that, you know, I mean, maybe there's some crooked guy out there that would, but, but YouTube, hey, just be as, as crooked and, and wicked as you can and whatever, so I appealed the other one, I, I got a, another strike, uh, and I appealed that one, and I'm probably, probably going to get the same thing, there's you, people on YouTube are, are major hypocrites, so, whatever, uh, Lord will take care of it. Lord's going to recompense that whole thing. Um, so did I miss any questions over here? <laughs> oh, I missed that one. Uh, went to click on one of it. How do you get European guy to shut up, get the hold of his hands? <laughs> my grandfather, i got to tell a story about this. My grandfather was very much, he talked with his hands. He was an artist, uh, Milton Denlinger, and uh, my dad's side, obviously. And the one time my dad, when he was younger, he grabbed my grandpa's hands and held them down on his side. And he said, okay, now, dad, can you answer a question for me? And he couldn't do it. He couldn't answer. He said, what? I don't understand. What are you, what are you doing? What are you, yeah. Got all confused and things. He said, you have to talk with your hands, don't you? You know, and he just. Yeah, I guess I do. So I'm very much talking with my hands and, you know, people, uh, people take advantage of that. You know, oh no, he's, you know, making things here or whatever. Um, uh, okay, what's this? Brian, do you act for the first and last name? I don't think I understand that one. Um, not sure if you could be a little bit more clear on that. I'm not really sure what you're saying there. Should a married woman with no kids work or keep home? Uh, um, you know, I get in, I get into these questions and people kind of, you know, uh, people get me into this loophole type of thing, you know, where I say, well, you know, okay, I understand why a woman would have to work if her husband dies and she doesn't have money saved up. And I, I kind of get it. Then all the career feminist women jump on that and say, oh, he said it's okay to work as a woman. I don't know the situation. I really don't know what the situation was. You know, was there rebellion and, and it caused the death of the husband and, and you know, what, I don't know. I don't know. Um, certainly women in the Bible can make money. Um, the Proverbs 31 woman, she made things with her hands and sold them at the market. She actually was buying, uh, excuse me, land and things. Women can make money, but it should be from home, especially if you're married. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. So um, question, my brother thinks God gave him his wife. She was an atheist. Now she's more open minded, but she's still not a Christian. Any thoughts? Is my brother deceived by the devil? Um yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, you know, the, the thing of, and, uh, let me see here, let me go to it quick, it's first and second Corinthians, sometimes the, the scriptures kind of 
get mixed up in my head. You know, is that first or second Corinthians? I think it's I think it's uh second Corinthians chapter six where it talks about being not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Um yeah. Um verse fourteen, second Corinthians six, verse fourteen, be not unequal unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's talking about fellowship, it's talking about worship. Um but of course, if you shouldn't worship with them, then you certainly don't want to get married to an unbeliever. So I don't really believe uh, as a Christian that the Lord's going to, he's not going to bring a lost person into your life, first of all. But um, I don't think you should get married to somebody like that that's lost. Um, question, can you please make a video of your library and share some books you would recommend? Please and thank you. I had an old video of that, and I don't remember if I still do. Let me just check real quick. Um, it's a. It was quite a few years old, so I don't remember. Uh, ah, hold on a second here. Bookshelf tour, I think it was called. Was that it? I might have deleted it because it was pretty old. I think I deleted it. But um, yeah, I don't I don't think I have that up anymore. So sorry about that. Uh, do you think God might ever call someone out of a secular job to be at home with his family? Um, well, if you can provide for him somehow. You know, get you know, rid of your debts and things like that, and you're able to just kind of, you know, live off the land somewhat. You know, then yeah, I think so. And you can still pay your bills and whatever else. Um, okay, I'll go down through. Okay, your mother, father, give you a name. The first and last name, uppercase, is the creation of the government. So I ask again, what name do you act for? Which name do you believe is the fact? Uh, I think you're getting into some of that uh, patriot stuff there. I would watch out about that. Um, can you be more specific about Gene Kim? I listen to him and I like his teachings. Well. My biggest issue there is that he's trying to get views with monetization and you know, that's a problem and I realize he's young. I realize, you know, there's some pride issues there. I've, I've seen a few of his videos and it's, you know, I came here to YouTube and I'm the one that's going to straighten things out and the new IFB spoke against me and look at what God did because they spoke against God's man. Yeah, man, you got to watch out for that stuff. Um, But uh, let's get the verse here quick. You know, Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I speak, seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Any of the brethren on here, on YouTube, understand. You just do some kind of a Bible study on just praying or some kind of thing like that. You're not going to get very many views. Um, Gene Kim comes out and he does this thing about, you know, the serpent seed or Satan has a son who is he or something like this. And it's going to millions of views. You make a lot of money when you're monetized. And, uh, you know, secular work, no problem. But when you start preaching the word of God and you're trying to get money from it, you're going to do exactly what Gene Kim is doing. You're going to create clickbait. Aliens and Martians and UFOs in the Bible. What are they? And is the Vatican secretly an underground base for Elvis? And, and you know, it's just, and it, there's the weird stuff. And and that's dangerous. It's very dangerous. A lot of things that he stands for, I would agree with. Okay. But there's those dangerous little things there that if you're a man pleaser, it's a problem. 
Okay. Yeah, and that's that's another one there. There's some wacky videos of Gene Kim and his church doing wild things in the pulpit. I'm going to be talking about that in the future. Um, a lot of the Baptists, you know, the I know Ruckman's church was pretty wild and whatever else. Uh, I've been in some of the his graduates' churches and they get real wild and whatever. The Bible says you're to be sober, okay, and yelling and screaming and doing cartwheels around the thing and jumping up on top of the, you know, running across the top of the the pews going down through the church and I've seen some pretty wild stuff. So it's not being sober. I mean, where's it at in the book of Acts? Where's it at in the Bible? Where's it at in the New Testament? Where are they doing these things? It's not there. You know, the authority, not Ruckman reference Bible, the King James Bible. So, um, okay. Uh, well, people have babies during the millennial reign of Christ. I would say yes to that. I do believe so. Um, you know, I was talking with a brother uh, yesterday about the thing of, you know, Christians going in, whether they do or not, whatever the, the rain, do we rain in there or is it rain into eternity? Whatever. Good conversation. Um, but certainly the people that get through the time of Jacob's trouble, there will those be those people that do, you know, make it through the end of the thing. And, um, you know, I do believe that they will be having children. And uh, I think that the Lord's going to restore a lot of the nations and things like that. Specifically, so the nation of Israel, they're going to act, get actually get the land that was, you know, promised them, promised to Abraham and his seed. And certainly they will have children. The Bible talks about a children dying, you know, a hundred years old or whatever in that time period. Um, meaning that somebody that dies when they're 100 is going to be considered a child because they're going to be living Pretty much the whole way through it. I believe that. Um, do you still have the Elvis Hitler video? Uh, it's on the um, external hard drive thing. They they took it down because I had the little thing there with Elvis and Hitler and whatever else. You know. Uh, I have a question. Your opinion on stuff like CBD. CBD, CBD. Um, not sure what CBD is. If somebody can, uh, you know, tell me what CBD is that marijuana or something like that. Um, I forget. I don't know. Uh, I was thinking church Bible publishers at first, but that's not church Bible publishers. <laughs> um, okay. CBD. Uh, it is about a marijuana. Yeah, the, um, the whole thing with, with marijuana, my issue with that uh, is a lot of people are doing this whole marijuana thing. I'll click on Chantre's question there. Um, a lot of people are doing the whole marijuana thing and, oh, I have some pain, so I need to, oh, I can do a joint or whatever else they do. I don't even know how it works. I'm not a druggie, but uh, you need to deal with pain. You know, pain is very character building. You know, we're not talking about somebody dying of chronic, you know, they're they're going to have a week to live or something. I'm talking about young people and my back hurts or something, you know. You don't need to be taking pain stuff all the time. Can you please do a video about the Serpent Seed Doctrine? Ruckman and I think Hoffman agree with it. Um, serpent, seed, serpent Seed Doctrine is basically that, that, uh, that the devil, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, did more with Eve than just beguile her. There was fornication involved, in other words, and that his seed went on and, and that there's these people that are the seed of the devil, that first thing there and whatever else. I don't agree with all with it. I, I think he was, you know, wrong on that. Um, are my comments invisible? No. Uh, who are the lost 10 tribes and where are they now? Um, well, uh, I don't believe that there are any 12 tribes right now. I mean, they're, they're there, but they're not being shown to be there because the Lord's kind of blinded Israel for now. Um, but the 12 tribes are going to be coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. Um, 
Uh, question is the inheritance of the thousand years for the Jews only. Well, there's some, you know, different thoughts on that. I would say that the, um, it is for the Jews in the sense of their, it's for the nation of Israel. Those who get through the time of Jacob's trouble, they'll inherit the kingdom prepared for them, certainly. But then you see there's another verse of scripture that talks about, um, you know, where he's talking to the Pharisees. The Lord's talking to the Pharisees and he says, let me get the exact verse here. Let's see, cause I don't want to, I don't want to paraphrase it or whatever else. Um, kingdom of God. Oh, let's see here. The Lord's talking to him and he basically says, Is that it, Luke? Yeah, Luke chapter 13, verses 28 through 29. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. So there you have the Jews, the patriarchs and things. Verse 29. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. So there will be Gentiles in, you know, I don't believe, you know, the Lord's kind of revealing a little bit about the, the church age and, and in, even into the time of Jacob's trouble. Because you see Revelation chapter 7, there's a great multitude that gets saved out of every people, tongue, kindred, nation. And I believe that. You know, there's a lot of things I can't quite work out in my head about the whole time of Jacob's trouble and whatever else, because it's not specifically for us today. But I can just point to what the scriptures say and say, I think that it's showing that there will be Gentiles in the millennial kingdom. Uh, it's not just all for the Jews, in other words. Um, I will check with my wife about the thing of the letter from Estonia. Uh, do you think the do you think the italicized words in the KJV are inspired perfect scripture? I believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, um, including the italics words, the words in italics. I believe that they're supposed to be in there. I think that the Lord has shown His hand of approval on the King James Bible. If it wasn't His word, He wouldn't bless it. So. Um, okay, what will happen to communist and socialist in the end times? Um, it's going to be destroyed, I believe. I believe that the uh, end times political system will be one of a fascist dictatorship headquartered in Rome um, and a Christ, a false Christ and a false trinity, really, because you're going to have the Antichrist, you're going to have the false prophet and the dragon. Three, and um, they're going to be ruling things. So, oh, I just saw one up there. Okay, trying to get down through here. Do you have any advice for the fatherless in this current time? Uh, young man or a young woman, whatever that doesn't have a father. Um, that's that's kind of a rough one. Uh, you know, I would say that you know, there's a lot of things that you might be able to learn as a young man. And I mean, I had I I have a father. He's still alive. He's 80 years old now. But uh, I I had to teach myself a lot of things. He was an office worker, essentially worked for uh, Ford New Holland. I have a video about talking about the seatbelt thing with my dad sitting at the table in their house. And, uh, but he, he was an engineer for Ford New Holland. He designed farm machinery. So he did have some mechanical ability, but not a whole lot. And so I had to teach um, myself a lot of things. Um, do you believe in modalism? No, no, I do not. It's a uh, ridiculous nonsense that god shifts modes that is not true um is listening to music like frank sinatra dean martin bobby darren nat king cole and billy holiday sinful um it's you know is is mozart beethoven bach 
you know, whatever listening to that sinful, it's not about the Lord. So it's secular is, you know, uh, the thing that you want to watch out for with music. <clears throat> I used to have a study up. I think it's still available audio, but uh, the thing you need to watch out for music has three parts to it. It has melody, harmony, and rhythm, right? And I don't remember melody and harmony. It relates to soul and spirit. Rhythm relates to the flesh. If music has a very high, a very heavy rhythm, you have to have all three parts of those music, by the way, or all three parts there, melody, harmony, rhythm in music for it to sound correct. There has to be rhythm. But if it's overemphasis on ryth rhythm, like rap music, heavy metal, rock, a lot of, you know, some of the old jazz or rhythm and blues, things like that, very heavy drum beat, um, it's going to elevate the flesh. And so you need to be careful about that. And, you know, if you start listening to guys like Frank Sinatra or some of these others, um, you listen to one song that's borderline, well, then you're going to listen to other stuff, and then away you go. Um, do you have any opinion on Dr. J. Vernon McKee? Never studied him. Never studied his material. Uh, just, I don't know why, I just never really got into, you know, his stuff. So, no, I don't really have any opinion on Jay Vernon McGee. Uh, I got to get back here to Okay. All right. Question, who do you think the naked man is in Mark 14, 52? I, I know about this story. I'll just go to the scripture here real quick. Um, the, what was it? He fled by night or something. Oh, wait, 14, 52. <clears throat> Let me read the verse of scripture. Uh, Starting verse 51. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cloth cast about his naked body and the young man laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked um so i think it, it could be one of his disciples that was there and he was probably just you know maybe he was bathing or something like that and then soldiers came and he quick grabbed you know uh his linen cloth wrapped it around him and, and came over what's going on lord and, and he saw what was going on and and he ran, he dropped the cloth and ran away naked. So, but there's symbology there, which is rather interesting because when you study the second coming and the Lord comes down and he's, he, I believe he sends his saints out, the armies which are in heaven follow him, which I believe if you're saved, you're going to be in that army. And we go out and we bring all the, he gathers all the nations together for the judgment of the nations, Matthew chapter 25. And it says about the, the, the mighty men are going to flee away naked in that time. So it's kind of funny. There's a little bit of a dual application there where you have one of his disciples, I believe, in context. And he sees the soldiers and he says, whoa, and he runs away. He's bathing or whatever. And he gets out of there and he runs away naked. He's so scared of, of these soldiers that have come to take Jesus. And the, the irony of it is that Jesus, when he comes back, the mighty men and the soldiers are actually going to be the ones that run away naked. Because his, Jesus and his disciples are coming. So... That the, there's so much stuff in the Bible, you know, interesting little things there. Um, uh, do you think the earth is roughly 6,000 years old? Somewhere around there. I don't know. Um, not really sure. Uh, Have you listened to Bill Sales take on prophecy? Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Um, the 100,000 Revelation 5 verse 11, uh, 5, 11 million saved plus many thousands. Does that number include all children from all time or just adults? Um, the 10,000 times then 10,000 and thousands of thousands in Revelation chapter five. Um, I would say that that's, you know, there's, again, I don't really know. The Bible's not clear. You know, it's, it's, it says about angels 
and Jesus said in the resurrection, they neither marry nor given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So I take it to be, is, you know, who cares about the number of the angels that are up there right now? Well, Revelation chapter five, it's talking about saints being there and whatever else, the 24 elders. And then it mentions these angels. I think it's redeemed saints. Now, does that include the Old Testament number as well? Or is it just members of the body of Christ? I don't know. Uh, one more time. Does God hear our unspoken prayers? Um, yeah. I do believe he does. Uh, what is your favorite genre of music? Um, well, I like a, a couple different styles of music. I, I, uh, I definitely like um, like symphony orchestra type of things. Um, I like bluegrass, some of it. You know, I got to watch out for bluegrass. There's some, uh, you know, some of the, some of it kind of gets into the country music, the commercial country, as we like to call it. <laughs> uh, you know, where this person's cheating on that person, or you know, you broke my heart, and I got to go to the bar and drink now, or something. So, careful with some of the secular bluegrass stuff. Uh, old hymns are at the top, obviously, but it's so hard to find old hymns. You know, really good recordings of it. So. But, okay, does anybody else have any other questions? Did I miss any questions? Okay. All right. Uh, Jenny Dobbins here. It is the book of the Song of Solomon, a picture of Christ in the church. A picture, yeah. I do believe that. Um, it's not Christ. It, it isn't, you know, it's about Song of Solomon. Or, or Song of Solomon. It's about Solomon and one of his wives. Yeah. But there's definitely some application there, some symbology, whatever. Um, what will happen to the President of the United States after the rapture happens? I have no idea. Uh, he'll be here. I know that if it's Trump, uh, he's a Jesuit, very wicked man. Um, Brian, have you heard of the Vatican archives? Apparently they claim to have historical items and very dark grimoires. Um, yeah, there's stuff down under the Vatican. I'm sure it would turn your hair white if you know what it was. Um, Is it better to pray out loud or quietly? Uh, that depends on the situation. You know, sometimes it's it's best to pray um, pray out loud if you're if you're praying some spiritual warfare type of stuff. Um, if it's just something you know you're trying to witness to somebody and you're trying to think of the right thing to say, don't pray and say, you know, Lord, I don't know what to say. Give me something to say. Don't say it out loud. No. <laughs> kind of. Keep that one quiet. Somebody's talking to you about the Lord. Just kind of go, I don't know what to say here, Lord, you know, in your mind. So, um, end time warrior. Do you think Melchizedek was Jesus? Absolutely. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. I have a whole study on that. I mean, it says Hebrews chapter six, all through it. Jesus, you know, it's Jesus is Melchizedek. Um, without father or mother, it's because he's part of the Godhead there. So, the God, the father doesn't have a father. So he can say that because the father is the soul. Jesus is the body and the Holy Ghost is the spirit. That is the Godhead. So question, can you someday do a live uh, stream, I guess, with questions on your off grid channel? Um, we'll see. I'm not sure about that, brother. I'm, I don't know what to say on that one. Um, Um, uh, Ryan, Tim left you a comment earlier that he has all your marching design videos compiled into one movie on his channel, so it's only a matter of time until YouTube flags him. <laughs> we'll see. 
Uh, there's there's so much of my stuff mirrored on other channels, you know, things that have gotten taken down, and it, it's on YouTube. It's still available, but they just don't like me. I guess they're trying to, you know, people think if they can take me down, then you know somehow the Bible believing movement ends or something or whatever. Um, do you think you must? Do you think we must repent of our sins to be saved? Well, you know that that whole thing there. I've preached for years and years and years on the on the issue of repentance. Um, when you repent of your sins, some of the old time preachers would preach that you need to repent of your sins and things. They mean that you're trying to, you know, you have to stop saying I'm a good person and you know I'm not a sinner. I'm not a bad person. You know, that's what these old time guys would mean by the thing of repenting of your sins. They didn't mean you had to turn from every sin that you've ever done and you have to stop sinning to be saved. That's not what those guys meant. You know, the guys like Lester Roloff or, you know, some of the old time guys like that. So people twisted that whole repent of sins thing into something that, that the original guys that preached that way didn't mean anything about it. Um can you do tutorial videos on your off-grid channel? In the future, I will be. I um, actually built a bookshelf, two bookshelves here. Um, this past week, I guess it was, I built two bookshelves. And my wife was saying, you need to record it. You should be recording it. And I said, yeah, no, I just got to get it done. You know, it was a really cold day outside. My hands were freezing. And I just thought, I don't want to make this any longer than it has to be because I got to get these shelves built. So I am planning on doing some more of that type of thing on the secular channel. Um, so okay hello brother as far as interracial marriage goes how would you go about discerning your kindred i descend from shem as an arab is it okay to marry another shemite that's not arab well you know the, the whole thing with interracial marriage you know i realize there's a lot of people that are really blended and whatever else and you know i'm not saying you have to have this perfect genetic thing whatever just common sense you know i mean what's what is your dad's you know nationality whatever you want to say. Um, just try to marry within your um, nationality, if I can say it that way. It makes problems if you don't. <laughs> you know, people, again, you know, get, in, get into a lot of stuff there. Regarding censorship on YouTube, is BitChute or BitTube an alternative? I think you mean BitChute. Um, I looked at it. I don't know. I, I hesitate to get into anything else, you know, like – I'm just going to put something out there. I, and I'm, I'm really stupid when it comes to technology stuff. Maybe something's already there. But what I wish could happen is, you know, I remember I'm from, I'm an old geezer, you know, now. Not as old as some of you. But uh, I remember before there was such a thing as VHS tapes. And they came out with these VHS tapes. Wow, you, know, you can actually watch a video at home? Wow, that's so revolutionary. I mean, I literally had relatives that had the old real things, you know, that, put it on and you know it's planned and movie um but then they had vhs tapes and then you could record you know video off television wow what amazing and then it was uh, these big laser discs they had these huge laser discs and then they made dvds and then it's live streaming video and whatever else and what i'm hoping is that there will come a time where people can have really good video players on their website and some new video file format that you can store it kind of like mp3 you know and i know there's mp4 video i get it but i'm saying like a very condensed file that you can put on a website that doesn't take up a whole lot of room and yet it can play in high definition on a player on somebody's website so you don't need youtube you don't need bit shoot you don't need whatever a streaming a type of technology that allows streaming video on private websites without all the junk so uh question what is your opinion on discerning between saved and false brethren how far have you seen a false brother go before found out oh boy that's a good question um uh you gotta ask their testimony but that doesn't really mean a whole lot anymore because people can lie to you 
you know, the, the one disadvantage of putting out so much doctrine on in a public forum like YouTube is there's a lot of people that listen to it and they can copy it and pretend that they're Christians. Um, it's a matter of basically just you have to sit back and watch people. You know, uh, there's a lot of people that I know of that are that are in things that I disagree with. They work jobs or they have lifestyles or whatever, and I disagree with it. And I just zip. If it's not some kind of major doctrinal thing, I'll just kind of sit back and watch and say, okay, if the Lord's going to deal with them, He's going to get them out of that, or He's going to do this, or He's going to do whatever. Um, people will. Uh, you just have to let people have time. You have to have grace and. Um, there's some people that you, you know you have to come out and you rebu rebuke them and if they're real they'll just kind of back off and say okay and they'll break fellowship um, but they'll stick to their beliefs that they've had they'll stand by the King James Bible they'll stand by all the doctrinal stands of the King James Bible proper doctrine but if they're false they will join the enemies of Bible believing Christians I've seen that many times um okay yeah i remember beta tapes too yeah i forgot those very true sister um well i skipped my question uh because the comments go up really quickly and i don't always see them when i'm answering one um what was your question read it again i'll try to remember it um, are you still planning on producing a line of KJVM gospel tracks? I'd really like to. That's a future plan. I don't know how that's going to go, though. Uh, I used to write tracks and just got away from it. Uh, without getting too deep here, where do you think we are as far as 5G affecting us physically and mentally, spiritually? Ugh. <laughs> um, I follow different channels and things, and, and uh, there's a guy... Uh, not too far from where we live and he's talking about he's not seeing birds anymore the, the little birds are just gone and, and whatever else and um, and certainly I'm, I've seen a little bit of that we're in a pretty remote area so we don't have a lot of cell towers or whatever else around but um, I think as more of that stuff gets in the 5g thing Lord only really knows I mean it's gonna be it's gonna affect people's sleep and everything else so I would say it depends on where you live unfortunately um, question how much involvement should we allow the government to have over our homeschool are we to obey every law even if it goes against scripture no you do not obey laws if it goes against scripture um, again we've gone way too far um, uh, you know we've, we've gone way beyond where things should have gone to um, in terms of government intrusion into our homes and uh, you know, my advice is, I mean, the perfect scenario would be to have a child and not have them registered or anything with the government and just the government doesn't have a right to tell us what to teach our child. That's the perfect thing. But, you know, if you have a, a child and you're homeschooling, you have to do the report in and whatever else, make it legal homeschooling. It's, it's, it's tough. You know, I, so, Yep, I went and clicked there. Oh, there we go. I asked where you thought we could be in the end times timeline. Um, we're not, well, end times, yeah, well, I'd say we're in the end times, definitely. Um, we're in kind of the rumors of wars area right now where Jesus was talking about it, and earthquakes in diverse places. Famine, pestilence, that stuff is yet to come, I believe. There are some areas that are affected by that, but I'm thinking it's more of a, everybody's going to get hit by that stuff as time goes by i mean <laughs> there's some really bad things going on right now and most people are just oblivious to it you know i mean um uh we watched a documentary not long ago called um pumped dry and it was about the aquifers are being depleted by the farmers see hold on a second here i have to answer this thing i'll be right back
All right. Sorry about that phone call. Um, so uh, what was I talking about? Um, we are we are the next big event on the end times timeline is, of course, the catching up of the body of Christ. And then that Antichrist shows up and then it gets real bad from there. So. Um, nice branch chair. Yeah. Have you seen or heard of the big Sim on YouTube? He lives. He lives in Louisiana. Have no idea. Um, didn't know you had to file reports on homeschooling. Yeah. If you get, if you sign up for it and whatever else, um, I have relatives that, that do homeschooling and they have to, you know, uh, they, they have to sign, I guess they have a reviewer come and, you know, whatever else. So, um, okay. Is the time of Jacob's trouble part of the end times? Well, you know, without getting real specific with it, I'm, you know, you could debate, you know, is, is the end times lead up to the last days or, you know, whatever I would say it's, you know, if I was just say yes or no, I'd say yes to that. The end times there where the Lord's kind of wrapping things up because a lot changes when you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, the world is going to definitely be a different place. Okay, how do you how do I explain the difference between the Godhead and the Trinity to people without going into too much detail? So the most simple way, very simple, actually. Um, say, do you believe that we that man is created in the image of God? The Bible says so. Yes. Okay. How many of me are you looking at right now? One, there aren't three persons. Okay, if we're made in God's image, then that means that there has to be one God, one person, which is what the Bible says. Okay, it's just that simple. And they say, okay, do I have a body, a soul, and a spirit? According to the Bible, I do. God would have, therefore have to have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Three, but it's one person. Very, very simple. All right. Are Christians required to vote? No. Definitely not. Um, voting, in my opinion, is pretty much a waste of time. I mean, it's not elections, it's selections. Okay. Uh, I think at one point in time, you could have made the, the argument for voting, but I mean, local, small local level, maybe, but president, presidential elections are a joke. They're going to put, the Vatican's going to put whoever they want in there. We got a Jesuit for a president right now, so big surprise. So uh, here. Okay. All right, I'll answer this one. Is it wrong for me to want to become a filmmaker or a financial advisor? Well, I don't know. Don't really have much of an opinion on that. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? Because I'm going to finish up here about two o'clock. We'll go till two o'clock and then, uh, then I'm going to stop this live stream. Um, if you're just tuning in, we were talking about this book here, Saint of the Wilderness, about a man named Robert Sheffy, a circuit riding evangelist back in the 1800s. So. 
Okay, there's a question. Question, is PayPal still working? Well, yes and no. <laughs> well, you can still get donations through PayPal, but we can't buy things with PayPal. So I just have to transfer the money to our bank account and I can use the, you know, regular Visa debit thing or whatever else. So yes, PayPal still works somewhat, but they're, they, they got us in this weird thing right now where you have to provide certain papers to PayPal, but we don't have those papers because we're a sole proprietorship is how we're registered in the state of Maine. So they're asking us for corporation papers or whatever else, and we're not a corporation, sole proprietor. In other words, me, I'm the, uh, um, the only one that's, you know, listed there making money. Um, can you pray for my health? I have chronic pancreatitis. Um, I stopped drinking years ago and I'm eating healthier, but the pancreatitis keeps popping up. Um, best thing you can do, just do a, a, like a Google search or whatever kind of search for natural health cures for pancreatitis. That's what I've done on many of the issues that I've had. And uh, you'll find out a lot of things. You just got to try things. I can't, I can't say, well, here's what works for me. This will work for you. Well, it might or it might not. Um, why are you trying to define a term like Trinity into something harmful and or negative? Because it is. It's a word that's added to scripture. People hold it as the core value of, or the core doctrine of Christianity and it is not. I've been saying that here. You know, the, the core doctrine of Christianity is the authority of scripture, written scripture. That's the most important thing. God's word is magnified above his name. So um, the Trinity is not that important of an issue, but people make it into this major thing. and It's an added word. And the Trinity is very bad because there's coming a Trinity in the future. Sermon coming in the future on this. Um, the Antichrist, false prophet and beast. Or excuse me, the Antichrist, false prophet and dragon. So there will be a, a Trinity in the future. You have to watch out for that. Question, have you seen Spencer Smith's videos? No, I have not. Don't know who Spencer Smith is. Sorry about that. Um, isn't what you believe often just described as modalism? No. Modalism is one God in three modes. They do not believe in the difference between soul and spirit. Okay. And they, they teach that the, the soul, body, soul, spirit are never together, you know, two of them together simultaneously. It's just the Lord kind of transforms into different modes. I don't believe in that. Uh, a soul and a body can separate. Okay. So you can have the father. And the son in heaven at the same time as body and soul. Okay. But that doesn't make them different persons. Um, can you please do an expository study on the book of Daniel? Probably not. There's some other ones that come before that. Um, I've been meaning to ask, is there any truth to psychology? Not psychiatry. People confuse the two. Yeah, just I'm not going to really study that a whole lot. <laughs> um, I just don't waste much time on it. Um, how is Oliver doing in the healing process regarding the loss of your furry friend? He's he's doing okay, but he still talks about it a lot. He still wishes he had a dog. We're just not really ready for that right now. <clears throat> just because of, you know, our living situation or whatever else. We're, we're looking around. Um, considering some things right now. Question, where are you going to get to the, I guess maybe when are you going to get to the Mazda Apparel um, for women and the videos about what a woman can not do in a dress thing? Um, uh, well, again, that's, that's more study type of stuff. Um, my wife has got a lot of information on the whole thing of, uh, She's really focusing a lot on the pharmaceutical stuff right now. She's gathering a lot of information, doing some really tremendous research, really amazing stuff. Um, basically, how to uh, how to cure drug. You know, if you're taking drugs, how to 
diminish that with nutrition. So you don't just have this cold turkey, boom, done with medication type of deal. The kind of foods that will get rid of certain side effects of drugs. So you can start to bring those foods into your life so that you can get rid of the drugs is what she's studying. Um, but there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot, the whole lot of, of um, information about when, like the roaring 20s, in the back in the 20th century, early 1920s and things, uh, there was a lot of kickback to women putting pants on. And we've been looking into some of that information. And and so we're it's still in process. We're still researching that. Um, do you still plan on putting out videos against the pharmaceutical cartel? Probably not videos as much as uh, we, you know, my wife is probably eventually going to write a book. She wants to actually, you know, uh, you know, help people, excuse me. Lord actually opened up a door for her to help an older woman that was on so many different pharmaceutical pills. I mean, she literally said, my wife was talking to her and she stopped and she said, so basically the doctor's trying to kill me. My wife said, yeah, he is. And they were, I mean, they were, they were disobeying their own, you know, rules and, and pharmacognosy rules and things is not pharmacognosy, pharmaceutical rules, think about something else. And I mean, you're not only supposed to give them two of this class of pharmaceutical drug, and they're giving her three and four, you know. So uh, a lot of what we're doing here, we we help people as much as we can, you know, locally, face to face, you know. And I don't record that stuff. Um, so, but I'm going to probably finish up here. Uh, question what is our purpose in this day and age before the rapture well do what you can to witness um to people as best as you can um and keep your head above water <laughs> that's a tough one uh there's a falling away so you can't just say well it's all about witnessing to people and i got to get people saved and whatever there are a lot of things that can mess you up as a christian in this and these end times don't get focused on liberty issues. That can mess you up. You can start really focusing in on things and you take your eyes off the enemy and you start to make Christians your enemy. And you start to get rough on the brethren and whatever else. Be real careful about that. Um, we need to really fight and, and look at the things that are coming in the future and say, you know what? There's the mark of the beast is coming. There's a lot of other things there. The Antichrist system, Roman Catholicism coming to power again in a worldwide setting. Focus on those things. Don't focus on a lot of side issues. So, um, but anyways, uh, I'm going to end it there. And um, so, uh, hope people were edified by the first part of the video there. Um, but uh, so, I just want to thank everybody, and uh, we will see you in future videos. Please do keep us in your prayers. Thank you to all who support the ministry. We always want to say that. And um, so um, had a good time and we will see you later.